Well, hello, welcome once again to Pale Blooms and Beyond. Thank you for joining us today. Barry Adamson is a Manchester-born musician, composer, writer, photographer, and filmmaker. I first became aware of Barry's bass playing on the 1982 album by Visage, The Anvil. But his career had started a few years before with ex-Buzzcock singer Howard DeVoto's band, Magazine. Mr. Adamson has also played with the Buzzcocks, The Birthday Party, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, an electronic band, and Sonic. Since 1989, Barry has released some nine studio albums, five EPs, and a slew of singles. He has contributed songs to a number of soundtracks, including David Lynch's Lost Highway. Barry has also written, directed, and scored several short films. In 2021, Mr. Adamson's memoir, Up Above the City, Down Beneath the Stars, was published. Well, welcome, Barry. Hi there, Greg. Thanks for having me on the show. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, so you were uh, born in Moss Side, Manchester, right? Yeah, that's right. What, uh, what part of Manchester is that? The side with the moss? <laughs> yeah, it actually Sorry. is. Hence Sorry. the uh, the historical uh, title of the place. Uh, sort of working class community, uh, uh, big in the industrial uh, era, just south of the city centre. Okay. And uh, big sort of uh, immigration area in the 60s. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, that's where I initially uh, had my, my first uh, sort of seven years, I think, there before we moved like actually a little bit further south, uh, which was seen to be sort of like reaching for slightly higher climbs uh, by that time. Okay. Uh, what about some of your uh, memories of your childhood? Do you remember uh, music being played in the household? I think the radio really was a, almost like a kind of uh, higher power, if you like. <laughs> right. the, the, the sort of mood and uh, the kind of feeling uh, in, in the household was seemed to be governed by what, coming, what came out of the, this uh, incredible... Uh, at the time, what seemed to be an incredible uh, device of uh, information and, and music. And uh, it was uh, a place that I certainly would like plug into definitely as a, as a way to sort of hear the, what was going on uh, in this, this, this world I was just discovering of, of uh, you know, music and sound and rhythm and uh, the, the the top records of the day and the people of the of the, the day as well you know like uh, Elvis Presley and uh, Beatles oh, and the Rolling right. Stones and other yeah. sort of hit makers of the time right I can remember listening to my little uh, transistor radio mm -hmm. listening to the AM radio over here mm -hmm. remember remember at night and just you know how how special that was yeah uh, were either one of your uh, parents musically inclined at all. No, not 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 one bit. Uh, well, I say that uh, thinking about my dad, but uh, my mother had uh, an incredible uh, singing voice, mm -hmm. which she didn't sort of like use in any professional or music capacity at all. She just used it as a like to sing around the house, and I I was sort of in awe of the sound because as I, as I was sort of you know, very quickly becoming a professor of music. Um, I, I realized that like what she was actually doing with her voice was, was way beyond what a lot of people could do with their voice who seemed to, to, who would seem to be professional singers. It was quite daunting in a way. It was quite like this, this powerful sort of thing that came, came out of her. And uh, my dad were, um, wasn't musical at all, but then told me stories of how his father, uh, who I never met actually, could play anything, like anything that you put in his hands, he would get a tune out of it, no problem. But but, but it, it it sort of, my, my dad just didn't even, wasn't interested and, you know, wasn't even moved to, to try and experiment, you know, even. It kind of uh, skipped a generation. Yeah, it? I think it really did, yeah. Well, uh, 
can you remember uh, one of the first uh, singles or albums that either someone got for you or that you that you bought? Mm. I think it was uh, a a copy of um, in terms of me buying it. Uh, a copy of the uh, the Beach Boys record "Good Vibrations." Okay, okay. I, I think I, I think I, I'm right in, in saying I bought it for my sister for for her birthday, um, uh -huh. but really it was one of those presents that was intended for, for me um, <laughs> because I, I just was so entranced by the sounds of that yeah. coming from the radio. I mean, I'd heard stuff on the radio that really uh, sort of got my imagination going. Uh, Elvis's "It's Now or Never" in particular. Okay. Uh, but by the time I was say, I don't know, around nine or ten, mm -hmm. so I, I, you know, I could be out and I'd be in the record shop with my mom or something like that. You know, um, I would get yeah. That's when I got the good vibrations, and, and uh, it was just one of the most um, magical. And it's still, I think, today, it's one of the most magical recordings I've ever heard. Right, right. Well, yeah, it was kind of like um, you might have had a little ulterior motive there. If your sister didn't like it, then then it was yours, right? There you go. Win-win. <laughs> right. Win-win, <laughs> right. Well, talk. I found this interesting. Uh, talk about the song Brain Pain. And how old were you when you made that? I think I was, I, I think we just moved, we just moved house. So I would have been uh, like nine, nine or 10, maybe. Uh -huh. uh, and I just started to write these very strange songs, you know. Uh, there was two that stuck out in particular, which were Brain Pain, yeah. uh, which was a sort of comment about the, the world yeah. as I saw it at that time. And the other one was, was, was a, a, a very esoteric, beautiful number called uh, Visions of the Blind, which was, oh, which sure. I thought, wow, that's really, uh, that's, that's got something going on there, right there. Yeah. Well, have you have you thought about um, maybe re-recording those um, in a more modern uh, take? Or? No, I think I think they were. I think as they as they came out of me, that that's that that would be, you know, the way they would stand the test of time. I, I think I think they're fabulous as they, as they were. I mean, they weren't very you know highly uh, developed in any way, and it was more on the lyrical side and, and having an idea of how they might go, you know, like if I was strumming away or something like that. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. We'll talk about some of the uh, the music and some of the artists that you like as a teenager. Uh, teenage time w w was boomtown for the era that I was a teenager, which is the mid seventies. And so, you know, every like everything, that's, because everything sounded different and to each other. And, and there was, so there was so much variety and there was so much, a lot of rock music I got into. I don't know if that was like a thing, so the, the school I went to particularly. And then there was also like, so I had like on one side, I, I, you know, I'd be, uh, by the time I was like 18, I was a full kind of Alice Cooper fan. Um, and, uh, but, but, but earlier on there, between that, I'd gone on this journey from sort of Motown and soul and some soul rock, some psychedelic soul, psychedelic rock into the, the darker, you know, as a teenager, yeah. uh, getting into like 15, 16, and things got a little darker. So Alice Cooper was a welcome, uh, you know, sound that I really embraced. But then the, the stuff on, on, on the radio still, there was still like a kind of, uh, for want of a better word, addiction to listening to the, what was coming out of the radio. Like every Sunday, they'd have the you know the the rundown of, of the chart, and it was just incredible. Like you know, Roxy Music, David Bowie, uh, so all this stuff was going on at the same time. So it it felt like it was an incredible world, and it was an incredible time. And I thought I'd never say this, but now I'm an old man, I can say it. You know, it was a it was an incredible time to be alive, Greg. You know. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, a lot of the a lot of the music back then, is, I think there's just a few years difference between you, yourself and, and me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't really uh, grab on to and did, it didn't really strike me until years later, you know. And, yeah. And I think with okay. time, there's something to be said about that, you know. Um, yeah. But there, were, but there were, you know, a lot of bands from that you know time period. Of course, I was heavily into Queen, uh, 10CC. Yep. 
you know, some of, uh, of you know, you mentioned Roxy Music Genesis. I like a lot of the uh, products. Yeah. yeah, a lot of that too. But, but yeah, yeah, some yeah. of those are on my radar too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, can you remember one of the uh, first concerts that you attended, went to? Uh, let's see. Um, I mean, the, there's a lot of like uh, the, uh, around that that period, particularly. There's there's a lot of stuff we would go to. We'd like come home from school, then meet up again, and all go off to see. Like I can remember in one week I saw, uh, what was it Hawkwind, David oh. Bowie, and the oh. Groundhogs, <laughs> all, all all in one week. And uh, it was the Aladdin Sane tour in 1970. Three, I guess, or five, maybe. I don't know. But uh, yeah, and then that was on the Tuesday. I remember. I think the Hawkwind was on the the Monday, and Groundhogs were on the Thursday. And then, you know, of course, there was there was uh, yeah, all the bands would would come through. Uh, I remember at fifteen, seen seen Kiss, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, yeah, a lot, like lots lots of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tony McPhee. Yeah, yeah. That's I used to. I used to think that 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 you know, the album split was was one of the most uh, like a masterpiece. Really, <laughs> I still do in some ways. And, and, and Hawkwind, another one that I've, I've been into. Yeah, at, at, at that time as well. You know, Silver Machine was massive. Right, right. Here. Yeah. So that was why you know they sold out probably the concert just on that alone. You know. Well, you know, I've always been envious of, of you guys over there in the UK, because like you said, there were concerts all the time. Well, were you in any band uh, before Magazine? No, not at all. Okay. I kind of joined uh, Magazine literally overnight after answering a, an advert and, and fancying that I could play a bit of bass that was given to me by a friend. And, and I it had two strings on it, and I went to buy the other two strings. Uh -huh. Saw an advert from uh, Howard Devoto saying he wants to work with new musicians, having left the Buzzcocks already. I'd seen Buzzcocks play and I thought they were incredible. And I thought that the EP Spiral Scratch was, again, another masterpiece. So I was eager to get involved because I was like 18 years old and punk was just exploding. You know? And there seemed to be a way in for me, you know, a pe for you know, people of colour. There was a sort of empathy to... The struggle and we we were kind of like welcomed in this genre you know so i found it easy to embrace the idea that i could do something and i was at an art school and i didn't i don't know why i just couldn't settle down at all so then when you know i saw this advert i just said to a, a friend of mine I, i'm going to answer it and he went like what like and i just went i'm just going to do it you know i just felt it was just going to happen and uh so I went, you know, answered the advert, went round, see Howard the next day, played, he showed me a lick of a, a Pete Shelley lick for the light pulls out of me. Okay. And I and I'd stayed up all night with the new strings that I pulled and kind of just playing this bottom bottom me, like boom, 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 boom. I'm thinking that's cool, you know. And then he got to the got to the audition and how played this riff, da 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 da. And I just went boom, 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 boom. And he was like, whoa, that's it. That's great. And so as luck would have it, um, he said, like, yeah, okay, let's let's meet up again, you know, with the drummer. And we did that song again. And uh, also at that session, he showed me this what became our first single, Shot by Both Sides. And I kind of like dun, 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 you know, kind of played along with the the root chords of it. And then uh, and then I remember that. A riff off the song "Born to Be Wild," boom, boo, doo, boo, doo, boo, doo, like that. So I could go. So, so we, so we played the riff, da, 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 and I boom, doo, 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 doo. like it was "Born to Be Wild" to get back to the root note, and that, and that was like it all sounded like pretty cool. So that that kind of uh, confirmed uh, that this should go forward, you know. We and we kind of got on to. I was going to say, so you guys, you guys got on real well too. It sounds like. Yeah, I was strange with how because you don't really like get on in the normal sense. You know, <laughs> it was a kind of like the way things work, and you recognize it, and you just like 
that's the way it is you know it's you're never going to be sort of best buddies and that sort of stuff okay all right yeah a little quirky individual yeah um, yeah, yeah. yeah he had his quirks you know that's just which is great that's what made him great you know what made him, so made him kind of like stand out you know well you you mentioned shot by both sides classic track mm -hmm. another, another early track i like is a uh, definitive gaze i like i like that yeah one. off the uh, first track out of the album yeah that was a cool thing to do because it was sort of like being given the freedom to yeah. after punk and the kind of structures of, of that it was almost like giving yourself freedom to wander all over town you know and play like i was playing really high up the neck and doing these things that i kind of liked so that right. would make me stand out you know and then you know playing all around the tunes that we had yeah so a little ad living you you were able to, to do that for the what a little ad libbing with, with the oh yeah 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 but you kind of like ad lib in and then find parts in that that you could then repeat you know it, it, as as then a new structure but it was very but it was kind of different to just your da 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 you know it was more like you could just like because like if you think about that with the song definitive gaze it has this kind of almost like this groove you know, like this this other thing and so it's to find this the thing in it and then drop it at you know drop back into a kind of conventional punk if you like or new wave kind of style of playing yeah exactly yeah i i, I can hear that as well um hmm. well, well in um 79 you john and dave uh worked on the uh, visage project hmm ensemble i guess as some people call it how did right. uh, how did this come about well to be honest with you i i wasn't really that involved i i, I kind of went along with dave okay. dave was sort of like a, you know big friends with like uh rusty and midge and billy curry and uh i kind of you know so i would just come along you know and i i kind of went along and i so I wasn't really at the forefront in any way. And it's interesting that, that because it, it, the way it kind of worked out when it took off, you know, I I, I sort of like couldn't really, I, I didn't feel, I, I wasn't really that committed. I, and I had played on some things, like okay. B-sides of things and the odd track, you know, I quite like, I quite enjoyed playing on a track called Night Train. I could yeah. kind of do my thing, but everything else was was more or less electronic. And I was a kind of a you know electric bass, so it didn't really, I, you know, wasn't really that. And I, it wasn't really my thing because I, I felt it was more about fashion than anything else. Yeah. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, as it kind of grew in success, I, I I kind of pulled pulled away from it. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, it's sad about uh, Steve Strange just passing a few years ago now. Yeah. Mm. You uh. Was he quite a character? He was kind of the figurehead of the outfit that, that that was being, you know, and obviously Rusty and Mitch were kind of putting it together and kind of guiding him and directing him in what to do because he had a very strong image. So I guess that's that's what was being utilized, you know, above everything else. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I don't know if you played on these tracks, but um, off of the anvil, uh, the damn don't cry. No. You know, that's a nice uh, the horseman and uh, mm -hmm. look what they've done look what they've done are all all nice tracks off that uh, cool. back, back to the magazine um mm -hmm. i've always liked a song from under the floorboards uh, yeah from 1980s the correct use of soap mm -hmm. yeah uh i did uh howard come up with that title for the the album or or how did that <laughs> do you remember that the correct use of soap yeah, of course I remember. I remember it all. Uh, you know, I can remember how it's kind of—I uh, uh, don't want to use the word obsession, but uh, his kind of like affiliation with all things kind of uh, Dostoevsky, and and uh, so that kind of idea is pretty much the anchor of of the song. You know, um, uh, and the whole thing of you know uh metamorphosis and the whole kind of you know all this lyric great lyrical ideas he was putting into a pop song made it kind of really interesting and it was fun for us guys because we found like this this way to just sort of swing it out in a particular way you know 
Yeah, okay, gotcha. Well, another track I go back and listen to a lot is uh, Naked Eye from <clears throat> Magic, Murder, and Weather. Mm. Yeah, one of the, that was one of the, the ending tracks of, of the magazine days, yeah. You, you, you can kind of hear the sound of the, the ship sinking, I think, and there's a kind of the band that's playing on <laughs> as the water's sort of rising. <laughs> Creeping yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, like my, that was, that's what I was trying to do with my phone, give this impression of like, Oh, I see. I knew this question was coming, but the timing <laughs> didn't quite you, happen. You the way like, I've rehearsed it, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Um, well, did you, uh, all in all, looking back, did you enjoy your time in magazines? Uh, yeah, I think it was a really, I mean, obviously it was my first band, my first kind of foray into creative, you know, uh, work in terms of you know, putting things, to, ideas together through music. So I was thrilled for it to be to be there. I was I was thrilled to be like a part of something that was recognised as being something kind of you know pretty cool and, and uh, you know that had something going for it as well. Right, and a good training ground for you for your future. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But in some ways, not at all actually. Okay. Okay. As as we as the story will unfold, uh, and I'll tell you why. Okay, great, great. Um, what was uh, was one of the more memorable gigs uh, with with magazine that you guys that you played? Did you remember? Uh, I, gu I guess the one that ended up as being the play album, which was uh, in the festival hall in uh, Australia in Melbourne. Okay. I just remember that sort of like atmosphere and. You know, going as far afield, uh, I've never been to Australia before. It seemed as far away as you could ever go in your life right. in the in the late 70s, early 80s, you know. And okay. there we were. And, you know, and there we were being received in this great way. And we were playing. We were playing great because we just toured and toured, you know. And we played, like, through America and everything. And, you know, another gig would be uh, uh, Hurrah in New York, where... Uh, Andy Warhol was in the audience and uh, for me this was like such a kick you know it was like wow you know like I'd revered kind of Andy Warhol as a teenager and, and the, the short few months I went to art school you know and there he was you know that standing right there you know about 10 feet away and we were kind of playing away like going like looking at each other going you know like <laughs> that, that sort of stuff you know. Mm. Did you were you into Velvet Underground? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. It just yeah, that that was like the kind of the idea of kind of everything cool, you know, and 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 incredible ideas that you you know you could only think to one day aspire to, you know. Right. Well, you mentioned uh, you know playing in um, Australia. Mm. When did you and Nick Cave meet? Well, funny enough, I was introduced to his work there. Okay. I I met uh, a cousin of his mm -hmm. who said, you know, do you know the birthday party? They're from here. And I was going, no. And she played me uh, the, the song, uh, Mr. Clarinet. And I just was like, wow, this is, this is going to be the next big thing. I kind of just knew that this was going to take off in some incredible way, you know. And then it was, a it was only like a short time later that magazine dissolved or began to dissolve and and then they came over to uh play uh gigs in london for the first time mm. and so i went along you know and just thought that they were kind of really amazing and out there and they had this sort of spirit you know about them which was only kind of equaled by the british group the pop group i think at the time right so it was like seeing this wild version if that was possible, of the pop group, you know, and it was it was interesting because like I was DJing at this club, and they came they came the first night, uh, they hadn't played there, and there's about twelve people there or something like that, and then they played a couple of weeks later, and there was like thousands around the outside of this club, like just oh, queuing. Cool. Word had got around like wildfire, you know. Yeah, sad that that Mark Stewart just just passed recently. Yeah. That, yeah, that's yeah. that's really uh, a surprise as, you know one of those like what surprises yeah. uh beautiful man beautiful like amazing you know a mu musician and front man um 
I always, I always love that the album Why. I just used to play it over and over and over. You know, I used to play, would be like working with magazine and go home, and I'd play Why and The Idiot, Iggy Pop, The Idiot, and just listen to those and Talking Heads and Bowie's Low, and like listen to those albums like over and over. You know, and possibly there's a riot going on as well. <laughs> okay. Well, um, what capacity and what capacity did did you play with uh, the birthday party? Well, first I was helping out because I, I got to know them through them coming over to London. Then they went back to Australia and their bass player ran into a little bit of trouble and got arrested and got incarcerated for a short spell. Okay. So they came back and said, do you think you could, you know, fill in? So I did. It was only about like five or six gigs or something. But I did. <clears throat> and so they saw what I was about, you know. And I saw what they were about live, and it was one of those. That was a real kind of education because form and the form and structure that I got used to in magazine and sort of disappeared quite quickly. So the fact that I'd learned all this stuff was almost like, you know, well, here's a new curriculum, like, and all this stuff was like planted on the table, and I was like, okay, oh wow. So uh, you know, and then there was some sort of, you know, the occasional bit of like free form and, and and a bit of like stuff that just would just spontaneously happen you know actually that was more in the bad seas later on but where, where you, you know sometimes you didn't know it would almost be telepathic what you you're playing with somebody else which was a kind of amazing but wow we'll get to that 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 would be i think to, to to reach that kind of level um well did you uh notice it on howard's uh solo album from 83 you only played on a couple of tracks yeah yeah I, I mean just keeping it you know like hey how's it going you know i wasn't i wasn't really i wasn't i don't know if i was really uh bitter about the end you know it, it kind of came and it, and it had to, it had to come because of the way things go and i think when john the guitarist left okay. it, looking back now over all this time it kind of makes sense to me that then, that then at that point things started to unravel, you know, and we had guitarist after guitarist after guitarist. But uh, if I think about that, I think that's where the first kind of unhinging okay. started to happen, you know. Okay. Well, you did join Nick in uh, his new incarnation, The Bad Seeds. Mm -hmm. you stayed with him for four albums, right? I think so, yeah. Okay, so there definitely must have been, you mentioned that, Kind of psychic connection that you guys had that must have been well, it was, it was strange i think you were kind of you're constantly sort of on your toes in terms of like what was happening with the the, the music it wasn't like in a magazine where you have a song learn a song play the song it was almost like okay you had a song you had some ideas there was some ideas about the song but that might change like tomorrow same song same title same words same thing you know and then you'd be, the music you check might change. So there was lots of kind of variation. So it was something about that initially, it, it was something I had to get used to, but kind of welcomed as well, because it, it was like less disciplined, you know, and less sort of formal in, in structure. And so from a music point of view, that I found that very interesting. Would you Personally, call it I was going through hell. So it was, but you know, but that's that's also part of the story. I think that was kind of important. You know, I was the limits. Were, you know, and I was in that early twenties place of like, whew, you know, uh, invincible invincibility. You know, when I think about it now, I go like, I kind of sh shudder, like, my God. But you know, <laughs> that's what you're like. That's what I was like in my early twenties. You know, I was like bouncing off the walls. You know. Uh, the world is your oyster at that yeah at that kind point. of yeah but no i think the thing was the world wasn't my oyster so <laughs> i was trying to get the oyster you know <laughs> right right well uh <clears throat> you you must have struck up a good strong kinship together with nick uh to work with him for so long would you would you call it a kind of organic the music kind of was or kind of came out organically more, more yeah i think i think that's right i think it's yeah. I think it's a mixture of sort of uh, uh, drawing from a different kind of emotional wellspring, if you like. Like 
whatever that be. It could be even in the mood of the moment. You know, if there was a lot of kind of negativity flying around, then that would be used in the song. If there was an idea that Nick had been working on in the background and would bring it in, you would felt like you could support that idea. You would go for that as well. But then it was kind of like also the, the difference in personalities was extraordinary. I mean, I think that was a kind of a coup on Nick's part to sort of put all these people in one room and go, there you go, <laughs> you know, create something now, create something extraordinary. You know, it was so conventional, it, it, it was not. And so I think the kinship sort of forms because you're going through these sort of weird times, hard times, great times, you know. Um, our bands talk about it all the time now as well, don't they? <laughs> they kind of go like, Oh my God, it was just this, you know, it was like, it was a nightmare. It was great. It was, you know, it was all of those things. Yeah, yeah. Extremes, right? Well, yeah, uh, exactly. To get the, to get the, to service the song, you know, at the end of the day. Right, right. Well, I know his, uh, his vocals have always kind of reminded me of uh, Tom Waits. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't know if he was, if he, he was into him or. or uh, yeah, we, I, I can remember it was like going through a, a, a Tom Waits period. I think I think influences come in from all over the the shop, you know. Like, yeah. so I remember you know, we 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 all kind of would become, you know, swordfish trombones would be playing, you know, and we go mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and just think it was like the coolest thing in the world, you know, which it was actually, and still is. Yeah. How about uh, Captain Beefheart? Was uh, he... yeah, Beefheart was in there. Yeah. Uh, you know, doing the low yo-yo. Uh, <laughs> <this, laughs> yeah. Well, um, one song I want to hear about is uh, Tupelo. Mm -hmm. And you wrote it with Nick. Um, and you played drum on, on the track. I find that interesting. I played drums, yeah. 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 Well, that's because Mick Harvey picked up the bass and started playing it. Mm -hmm. And I was like... And it was, uh, it was kind of weird because you're being pushed around a little by these dynamics because like it, it's like someone takes your kind of your lunch and <laughs> starts eating it and you're going like, wait, wait a minute, what? I'm going hungry over here. Like, yeah. you know? So I, went, I, wanted, I just like literally walked across this like, wide expanse of uh, Hansa Studios in Germany and sat behind the kit and he was playing this little riff. And I thought, all right, Okay, what can I play? And I thought about the the Bo Diddley rhythm. So I started to play that. And Nick sort of like started to sing some of the stuff he had written down. And it all seemed to sort of fit together and become what it's what it became. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. About the the night that Elvis uh was born, the whole story. Mm. You know, mm. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever been to Graceland, by the way? No, I haven't, no. I haven't either. All right. Um, do, you, do you plan to? Uh, I don't, I think it's just too uh, too big, you know, too, yeah. commercial, too commercial now. Yeah, maybe yeah. A few years ago, maybe, maybe so, but not not these days now. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, did, you, did you see the movie? Did you see the uh, recent Elvis movie? The Elvis one. No, I'm not. I I don't know the uh, the Baz Luhrmann approach to 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 work. It's it's not something that that that, that I, I particularly uh, am drawn to for some reason. Uh, so I I always see bits of it. And I always kind of go like, oh, oh yeah, and then I don't really want to go for, get drawn in further. You know, I seem to sort of make that choice somewhere, not wanting to be drawn in further. Right. Right. I can understand that. Well, what mm -hmm. are some recollections of or favorite moments from being in the bad seat? <laughs> favorite moments is uh, I think the best. I think the, the most favorite moment is is getting out of there alive. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean the you know some of the some of the gigs like I, I mentioned that sort of telepathy that was going on in, in some gigs like we'd be touring and playing like I remember this gig particularly. In Amsterdam, and it, the version of the band was me, uh, Nick, Mick Harvey on drums, and Blixer, and that was it. 
just the, and it was a great unit. It was like we were really kind of quite forceful. The new songs were being played out for the first time. And I can remember even like before a gig, like we, instead of playing the song slow, for example, it, it, you know, it'd be like, okay, let's play it fast. And you wouldn't know where the changes were, but you, you just look and kind of know where the changes happened, you know. And uh, I also went back for a, a few years during the Push the Sky Away era. And some of those gigs were sort of quite amazing because uh, obviously they've 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 grown they've grown huge. <laughs> so we're playing, you know. Pl I can remember like walking on uh, to playing a just the great sound of the thing as well, the machine, you know, in Prague, eleven thousand people going in, in crazy, you know, and just the the whole machine of it was, was quite incredible. Okay, okay. Well, uh, moving on to. Uh... Luxuria, did you play on either one of uh, the the uh, Luxuria, Howard Devoto's groups? No, I didn't. I took, no, because I I felt that he was then hooked in with a, a guitar player and they worked together quite closely. So it was like their thing, like their band. I can't, I did appear one night with Morrissey on a, a concert and Morrissey sang something and I came on and played the light pulls out of me with Howard and so but that that was it and I, I can remember infamously that that Morrissey and myself never exchanged a single word okay to which I found out later he thought that was me and I thought no it wasn't at all right. it was you <laughs> <laughs> interesting interesting yeah yeah there's a lot of uh interesting stories there with the Smiths and John yeah and, and uh yeah so it's a lot like the uh, Pink Floyd, you know, with Roger and uh, and David too. You know, yeah. Who's the real evil one? Exactly. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, yeah, I know. When, when egos get the better of people, when well, egos uh, collide. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Well, you did go turn solo, um, not so low that we couldn't hear you at least. Ah. Um, and uh, yeah, let's let's get that little yeah um, mm -hmm. nightclub routine going. Um, your okay. first solo, your first solo release, Moss Side Story uh, from '89. A little nod to West Side Story, maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. But I thought it was kind of so extreme because the the things I wanted to write about it were nothing to do with West Side Story at all, and none of the sort of uh, ideas in it were suggested I should I I just thought it, it was a catchy title um, but some of it was some of it resonated that the, the whole kind of immigration story was in there a little bit and uh but 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 I was I wanted to write a piece that was fairly down dark and exploring film themes for the very first time right well I like the black and white cover um, yeah the whole album sounds like a throwback to the film noir that detected yeah period in history it's that's that yeah vibe. that was pretty much the driving force of doing the record yeah it's got that ominous air that hovers over mm -hmm. the that was really important for me to keep that as a it was kind of a, call, a calling card to get into the movies because it's you know obviously it got this name which was perpetuated by me as well of, of being a, a movie soundtrack to a film that doesn't exist right so and that kind of worked because it seemed to be a new thing but uh, you know other people were writing mu fil film music without a film you know i think but i just i was really inspired by a friend giving me this cassette of all these different soundtracks and they even though they were different genres it could have been from the same place right uh in my mind anyway so you get henry mancini that goes into quincy jones and, and for me I could see the relation through music of the two things. I thought maybe I could do both of these things, you know. And so I kind of tried to correlate this whole idea around, you know, influenced by Morricone and people like that. And uh, and then also some of the the music that I'd been involved in already. But to give the to give it its sort of signature and color and tone uh, was all based in in, in a, a noir existence yeah yeah i always like that that period in, in movie history too 
the uh, mm. well, have you uh, since since the release of that have you had any interest from from anybody wanting to base a movie on on that soundtrack or anything like yeah that? it's come up it's come up a few times and I'm always kind of reticent I'm always like um, well that was it you know that 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 is it that's my side story and so even I you know as I got more into sort of you know make, making making my own stuff I thought do I want to do that you know and, and for me what's beautiful about it is is that you can imagine the film for yourself so I I invited everybody that listens to the work to imagine their own film so that that's the film really so it felt a bit complete in that way right right using the imagination yeah 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 I think that's important you know leave it up to the individual uh mm. to uh, to do that um, well, your your second album is actually a soundtrack to a movie, uh, 1991's Delusion. Yeah. Uh, where you follow in the crime thriller motif. Yeah. Um, how did you get asked to compose for this movie? Well, this was the thing. This was like, this is the how the Moss Side Story calling card worked because it, it was kind of saying, if you like this kind of thing, then... This, you know, this is the kind of thing I'm into and the kind of thing I could bring to the table. But and I, so I got a call from uh, a company called Cineville in Los Angeles. They were making this film. And uh, would I like to be on board to score it? And I was like, yeah, this was like about nine months after Mosso's story came out. So I was thrilled, you know, to, to, to be working. Uh, and it was interesting because... I expected them to go, okay, just do that Moss Side thing. And they, and they did in some ways when they said, oh, but it, it's set in kind of Death Valley and, and there's a sort of spanish influence and there's this, you know, I was like, well. And then they'd say stuff like, okay, so this scene, the guy's driving through the desert, he's listening to opera uh -huh. in the car. So can you put that together? And I'd be like, yeah, sure. And I think, how the hell am I going to, you know, I don't, I've got the first idea, you know, the first, and then I can remember on a Saturday morning walking to a local market in West London, and there was three girls singing uh, sort of almost like Tudor type, da -da 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 like tunes. And I just went up to them. I said, "Would you work with me on a on a, a track?" So, and, I, and I very quickly went home and just wrote this this piece like against an acoustic guitar. Which the acoustic guitar could be like strings going dun, 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 like that, and then they came in and sang what I'd written down, right. the melodies that I'd written down, and it was absolutely beautiful and it works really well. So it was great because I was being stretched out of that like comfort zone of like da 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 da, da you know, which was awesome of that as well. But then I was you know I was asked to provide certain other colours and things that I'd never done before. So that, that I found that really fantastic thing to do. Yeah, I like that. I guess one of the opening tracks with that Spanish guitar, I don't, I don't yeah. remember the exact one, but that was very effective. I've, I've always liked that kind of sound. Cool. Um, well, um, since you mentioned, you know, like like the the early uh, Moss Side story was, was for an imaginary movie. This mm -hmm. time around, let me ask you, is it strange at first watching watching the movie, watching the film with your music? Does the music take on a new life? You know? uh, well, yeah, it, it, it becomes about the film. Uh, you know, I, I think that the, the image is, is and the cinematic language is the governor, as it were. Uh, so your music then becomes in part of that fabric and can never be listened to alone. Right. You'll Excuse me. Always, sure. <laughs> you, you'll always have that, those the images attached to the to the music. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. Yeah. I, I think about even when I was talking to you then about uh, certain scenes. You know, I, I can imagine them as these scenes rather than the music. You know, it's like the scene, uh, like like when you write to serve the song. I think you in this case you write to serve the image. You know. Now moving on to um, Soul Murder from mm -hmm. 1992, and it was nominated for uh, the Mercury Prize. Tell tell us what the Mercury Mercury Prize is. Well, the Mercury Prize was a, uh, and still is. It's a, it's a, to recognize uh, 
what's going on uh, in the music scene uh, at the moment. And there's, uh, a, a, uh, they categorize it, I think, across 10 or 12 albums. Yeah. And then you get kind of uh, extra promotion around your album at that time. I can remember being on a bus and just seeing this, this huge record shop with like Soul Murder, like covers and pictures all over it and thinking, wow, this is like, my little scratchy left field record, you know, right? Um, and uh, so yeah, and I, you get to go along to this event, you know, and you get a, you get a kind of step a statue thing, um, which I still have, and it, yeah, it's like an award ceremony. Oh, okay, so it's like our version of uh, something, not quite the Grammys, but you know, something in there. Used a lot of uh, quite quite an extensive lineup of musicians uh, assisting in making making that album too. Um, Soul Murder. Yeah, yeah. All right. And you did in, in continuing continued on with other you know after this too you know using using quite a few musicians yeah mm. yeah the um, are you pretty pretty proud of uh, Soul Murder all in all. Uh, yeah, I yeah I I like I like them for different reasons. I, I like the different uh, tonality, if you like, of the different records. I think possibly uh, uh, Oedipus and uh, the, an album which we'll probably get to later called Strange on the Sofa are my favorites. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You have a uh, you have a thing about uh, puns. Uh, having fun with puns. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I like I like language and, and playing around with meaning and maybe it's an English thing as well, the, the double entendre and the right. the whole kind of wordplay and uh, you know gymnastic linguistic ideas that sort of bounce around your head. In terms of being of using them in in songs and titles, particularly, and what are you thinking of? Yeah, what I'm thinking of is from one right off from Oedipus Schmedipus, uh set the controls for the heart of the pelvis. Right. Uh, think okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's about well, it's a song about teenage desire. Right. And uh, so, and I and at that time, I'm probably very aware of Pink Floyd's set the controls for the house of sun. But then there's the lust aspects of being a teenager where, you know, you only think about, you can only think about one thing, which Jarvis Cocker picked up on beautifully and for his like, you know, spoken word bit in the middle of that song. Okay. He, he, he becomes the, the teenager in lust, I think, you know. Well, how was it? I don't remember which was it this which which uh, soundtrack working with Billy McKenzie. How how was that? Um, yeah, it was great because what what happened was I I moved in the same street as him, okay. so I would see him. Okay. And uh, oh hi, how's it going? Da, 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 da. And I loved his voice. You know, I, I was a huge associate fan. Right. So the fact that he was there across the street, and I was working on an album, I just thought. <sighs> ask him you know ask him to come in and he had this idea for this song valley of the dolls mm -hmm. uh and valley of dolls and uh he just started to sing the most incredible stuff you know and that was it and it became what it is from that meeting really because yeah. at that point i was starting to feel that vocals would now be appropriate in terms of I'd, like I, I felt that i'd done quite a bit in terms of instrumentally expressive albums and I it was like sounds weird to say but Billy Jarvis and Nick Cave all on that all on that Oedipus album were kind of stepping stones to me then taking the mantle and performing my own using my own voice on my own work yeah yeah well uh, other spin on titles you asked me uh, I can't I like this one I can't lose to using you. And instead of I can't get used to losing you, I can't lose to using you. 
Yeah. No, it, it's isn't it? Uh, can't get loose to using yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can't yeah. get loose to using you. Which yeah. I had to pay. I had to pay Andy Williams for that because uh, oh, it's his title, even though it's a tongue twister turned the other way. Uh, yeah. Which, but I thought, yeah. I, I heard someone say that, and I just went like, "That's the that's, no, surely it's you know can't get used to losing you, but can't get loose to using you, so <laughs> right? Just funny, you know. You have you have to be careful of what you have to say. Exactly, that. exactly. <laughs> uh, it's true. And the, <laughs> and the the other one uh, and another one, deja voodoo. Yeah, <laughs> that, well, it was uh, that's uh, somebody said that to me as a, as a, and I. Actually, I'll credit that to the filmmaker Floria Zigismundi, who was who came over to to shoot the uh, "Can't Get Loose" video, uh -huh. and she said, "You know, like meeting you is kind of like a deja vu do." And I went, "That's incredible! Can I use that?" She went, "Yeah, sure, with pleasure." And so, and I was working on the song at the time, and so that became the title of the song. Yeah, like like that old classic. The voodoo that you do so well. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right. Brilliant. Um, now for uh, one of your more recognized tracks, I, I assume, uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Um, yeah. From, from Lost Highway. From Lost now, Highway, yeah. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I want to tell you up front, I haven't read any critiques of the song. Okay. But I, do, I do hear you sampling Spooky by Classics 4, right? Uh, no, it's not that's Spooky not, by Classics not, 4. It's by... Yeah, it's it's Spooky, but it's performed by uh, yeah, Gary it's not Walker the actual the Rain. Yeah, it's not the actual uh, original, but it is Spooky. It yeah, is spooky. exactly. And then also, it's a version. It's a version. And then yeah. also, it sounds like John Barry's You Only Live Twice. Am I right? No, that's... That's, that's, not, John, that's not John Barry. No, the other sample is yeah. uh, Francois Hardy. Okay. Called, a song called La, uh, La Tente de Souvenir. That's the sha la la la, sha la la la, right. sha la la da da da. And for some reason, that, that fitted with the Gary Walker sample. Da, 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 da. Soupy. That's soupy. <laughs> Spooky. <laughs> um, so, yeah. All yeah. melded together, then finished off with a massive attack. Dun, 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 dun. Right. Yeah, and then I'm back into like the groove. Massive attack. Well, yeah, mm. yeah, it just sounded like that. Oh wow, yeah. You know, a I little. Should I should have thrown that in. <laughs> <laughs> so I could see where they're very similar. Okay, I was uh, fifty percent there. I'll take that. Yeah. Uh, um, now talk about who is uh, Pansonic. And how did you end up collaborating with them on Motor Lab number three? Okay. There was a, a, a label that was an offshoot of, of, of Mute mm -hmm. uh, run by a guy called Paul Smith, who's a, a genius. He's, he, he's kind of, I think he you know, brought suicide to, to the table in this country. And, you know, a lot of work of, from, from real alternative spaces he, he was able to find. And he used to do it with this, Two these two guys uh, called Pansonic, uh, and they would do these heavy electronic kind of sounds, and they wanted to do something with a with a choir or an orchestra and a choir. So I went over to Iceland with them and recorded a choir there. Wrote with them, recorded the choir, and uh, then they added some of their electronic stuff and mixed it. And I think the yeah, I think that was the the track called the the hymn of the seventh illusion okay okay yeah are you, are you happy with and that was it? kind of it really uh there was what it wasn't much more there wasn't any other collaboration okay were you happy with the way it turned out yeah i think it's i think it's very strange little piece of writing but i, I quite liked it yeah yeah mm. and here's another one um with the uh the Play on words, or uh, possibly the entendres. Uh, the King of uh, Nothing Hill is that mm. possibly from Notting Hill? That's the one, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it was an area I used to live around, but I didn't feel kind of uh, like I, you know, and it's a kind of play of like 
when I was a child and, and feel like, you know, the king of your domain, but it was like, <laughs> I thought I could twist it slightly and, you know, make it. Uh, and then a friend of mine said, oh, you, you could have called it the king of rotting hell. <laughs> I was like, damn, <laughs> I missed that one. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, well, I really like the single "The Long Way Back Again," especially mm. the har harmonica. I think that that adds a, a, a nice flavor to the song. Yeah, that's cool. And I haven't played it before, but I just thought it would work. So I so I worked out, you know, if I could play that and play the guitar at the same time using a Bob Dylan kind of brace. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, that would work. It, it almost yeah. sounds a little bit like an old sea shanty too, you know? And yeah, I'm accused of that sometimes. Uh, <laughs> okay. There's a few songs that have that. So there's another song called Come Away, which is a bit sea shanty, which I don't know. I'm drawn to that place. And um, actually one of my favorite historical songs is what, what you know, what do you do with a drunken sailor? You know, what can you do with a drunken sailor? Because it's a brilliant song, and I think, and it was written by a guy who was like so like messed up, and uh, he used to write to this other guy who's the name I wish I could remember. Getting old, I tell you, um, and he used to write about you know uh, his troubles, like he was a kind of drunken sex addict of the time, and he would actually write, to, you know, what can we do with a drunken sailor? early in the morning and then the the other part is the you who ray and up she rises you know uh, all of this stuff was going into the word i think it's like a songwriting on, on a kind of insane level even though it's now this like <laughs> sea shabby so yeah i have an affinity to this to the sea i live by the sea now actually um, okay. it kind of draws me in quite a bit yeah I think so too. I've heard that, you know, throughout uh, musicians and the history, you know, have had that affinity for that, you know, and mm. just drawn to the sea. Yeah, yeah. So it's there's something there. There's something there. Well, are you mm. a are you a, a water sign, by the way? You... No, Gemini. Okay. 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 Air sign. So, you know. Well, air needs water. Water needs air. So. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well. Um, mentioned that album uh 2008's back to the cat um i like spend a little time i, I mm. love that organ it's like that throwback organ from the from the 60s yeah great player nick 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 pletus is called it's just a wonderful musician i mean he's one of those musicians who would play with tina turner when she came over in this kind of world and so if you give him a solo, he's just murders it every time. He just kills it, you know. And I thought, like, this is a flavor that I really like yeah. to use on this record. Yeah. That's one of my favorites as well, actually. Back to the Cat. Yeah, yeah. I think it's got some solid. I, I sometimes I hear I hear tracks say on I don't know where would it be probably Instagram. Someone might use something, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll go like, and it'll take me a while to, to recognize what it is. And the song Walk on Fire came up the other day. And I was going like, what is that? Don't, 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 da, da, da. And I was trying to remember the process of doing that and putting it together. And like, was it a sample? Was it this? Was it, I was going, no, that's that. I played that. And then I put the, the, the sap, you know, and all this sort of stuff comes flooding back that you can't yeah. quite remember because it's gone now in the ether. It's like disappeared, you know. You know, that's quite a nice feeling, but it, it reminded me that, that, that Back to the Cat is pretty special. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about that, too. We, that may be your example of uh, hearing one of your songs that you, with any of the various bands that you play with, or your, your solo material, the strangest place that you ever heard, heard one of them. Uh, strangest place. That you didn't expect to hear hear one of those tracks. I guess it's not so strange. I guess when you think about it, but you don't think your your, your music would be played in like you know. A, it's not really. I don't, I've never really. I've got to be honest, Greg. I've not really heard my music played in a strange <laughs> place. It's always like cafeterias or you know hotel was a strong. Ah, maybe a hotel 
lift okay. was, was, the, was the weirdest one because you kind of think to yourself sometimes this is like hotel lift music you know and then then you yeah. hear you know yeah wow yeah elevator music as they they call it wow well um another track off of that uh, back to the cat the opening track the beaten side of town yeah i think i think that uh, i could i could hear nick nick k doing that it, i think it owes a lot to, to mm. nick k Really? Wow. And, 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 you know, your vocals on that one. Well, I never thought of it that way, to be honest. I still perform that live, actually. Okay. Uh, but I didn't really see it as uh, something from that place. It was more like the, the whole noir thing again, you know, and then uh, a lyric that talks about, you know, a guy kind of stumbling through life and ending up, you know, in this place. But trying to find some strange salvation through signs and this kind of thing you know uh and then dreaming of some sort of salvation but ending up on the beaten side of town and embracing that that's where he lives that's where he comes from maybe there's something in that maybe that's part of my attraction to things that you know nick would do or has done or you know okay it reminds me of um, the uh matt johnson's uh the beaten generation uh, mm. another little play on words there too. yeah yeah um and uh people the, the track people i think that's yeah. got to be one, one of your prettiest melodies i think that that's right one. thank you uh yeah, yeah i you know it's it's a uh, melody is a strange one it's, sometimes you hear it sometimes you play a chord sequence and it comes and uh, other times it comes formed with words, you know. Uh, that was one of those songs that got written in about 15 minutes, you know. It just started to play and then heard it, heard, you know, people, they are dumb, da 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 da, da and then an idea around what that is and play on words with that, you know, I've been this way before, now I open the door, you know, and, and then it, it just goes from there and then, then you're off and running. Yeah. Yeah, very, very pretty, pretty track. The Sun and the Sea is another track like that, like a 15-minute yeah. track. Yeah, yes. I got is. out of bed, picked up the acoustic guitar and just pretty much played and sang the whole thing in one go. Yeah, I uh, had that. Rarely had, happened. <laughs> really? Really? Okay. I had that coming up and mentioning that one. I wanted to throw in, though, the uh, 2009 uh, magazine reuniting and playing a few UK dates. How was, how was that? Um, it was, it was kind of uh, eye opening because, you know, you go back after all that time, right. And you, you're on stage playing the same songs and they sound the same. And you just see this like audience of people, you know, who were there when you, you were playing them last time with their children. And yeah. that you could see them almost like saying to the children, this is what I've been going on about all these years. And I thought it was quite special, really. I, I really did enjoy it. In fact, I was up for it kind of carrying on. But then it got into sort of very strange territory of like writing new material and making a commitment like for five years and this kind of thing. And I, I had my thing going. I didn't really want to, you know, to get that. be involved in something like that, really. Yeah, well, could you say the magic was still there with, with you guys? Yeah, that's what I found eye-opening, you know, like I can remember the first night and standing behind a kind of curtain and yes. then the curtain rising and, and we got straight into the light pulls out of me and it was just incredible. It was the same, you know, it was the same after all those years. Yeah. Same yeah. in a great way, not in a kind of like, oh, not this again. It was just like magical. Yeah. Did you notice a lot of uh, younger fans there that maybe uh, had recently been turned on to, to the magazine? Yeah, I think there was. I think there was. Yeah. Uh, other, uh, you know, aside from people like bringing their teenage, you know, children with them and that sort of stuff. Right. Right. Well, you mentioned um, the sun and the sea. And I had that coming up off of uh, I Will Set You Free from 2012. Yeah. Another yeah. one, uh, Turn Around. Another mm. one that I really like off of that one, too. I like the ly lyrics in that one, too. Yeah. Thank really, you. Yeah. 
Yeah, that that's that stint of writing was done. I could, I'd, I'd moved house, got a new studio location, and started to get into a whole. It's funny how each album seems to command its own body of work, and uh, that's a particular thing to that record only you know and I pro if you ask me to write turnaround now I, I probably couldn't even start to think about it you know like I'm writing a new album at the moment and it's different again to those albums and it has some things you know that I recognize but it's commanding me to do things that possibly I haven't done before you know in a more in a, a different way and uh which was like the same with then with then with turnaround you know like turnaround the story of two people meeting in a in a psychiatric institution, I think, as right. I remember it, and running right. off, you know, together. <laughs> do you, uh, songs from your past, do you kind of put them to bed and don't really revisit them? Or are there any tracks that you feel are unfinished that you, you'd like to go back and revisit? Uh, most of the songs, I think, are, are finished when they're finished. Uh, they're brought out again in a live situation and that can give them a new breath of life if I want to sort of alter them or tinker with them in any way but I feel pretty much like they're they're done when they're when they're done and that's it I, I, I quite like that that's that's it it's finished walk away from it right right we'll talk a little bit about the short film the swing the hole and the lie from 2014 yeah well I had you know I'd been working on you know, the odd film here and there, and I got to see how things work. And I was fascinated with the fact that now it was accessible to make a film. Like you didn't have to hire a crew and all this. Stuff. I mean, you still did, but you could use a, a small camera. You could have like your own kind of, you know, your own uh, rig and, and, and a few people and make a film. So that's what I did, you know. I'd had a little bit of practice earlier with a film called Therapist, which is an album at the same time. So you get 45 minute film and a 45 minute album, but this was like purely for a, a, a short film release, you know. Uh, it kind of, it did okay. It, it got to camp and played there and got some pretty good feedback. Yeah. So yeah, that was like my filmmaking stint, as it were. <laughs> okay. How long was the, the, the film? This was a 10 minute film. It was like an intentional short film. Right. Because the one before was 45 minutes, which was you couldn't play anywhere. And at the same time, it was, so it was stuck in this weird limbo. Yeah. So okay. I thought I'd make a proper short film. Okay. All right. All right. Well, uh, 2016's, here's another one with the play on the words. Uh, know where to run, K-N-O-W, not N-O. Mm -hmm. no, be sure you know where to run. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, exactly. Amen. You mentioned uh, Come Away. Mm. Um, the very opening track found uh, fascinating. In, in Other Worlds, I found mm -hmm. it very proggy, very progressive. Um, and it almost reminiscent a little bit of Tubular Bells, I think, Mike Oldfield. You know, oh, yeah. I, I just heard it then for the very first time. Do -do 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 -do. Yeah. yeah. But that's, yeah, it's kind of different as well. Dun, dun, yeah. dun, 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 dun. Wow, I should have done it for an, a whole album. Um, <laughs> right. <double> album. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a little, it was a little kind of chase theme that I was messing around with for ages. And I thought, I don't know what to do with this. And then I ended up just sticking it on the front of the album. So, uh, because it was a chase and the album was called Nowhere to Run. Yeah, so I thought that can kind of give it a little, you know, un unconscious. Uh, psychological lift. Um, I really like that. That uh, again, yeah. Uh, this re I think this record was pretty. I, I I felt like I stretched myself. This was like a kind of comeback album almost because I went, I sort of went off on tour with the Bad Seeds, and this is where this album started because we were on a vast tour of America from coast to coast and in between. I took a whole bunch of photographs, mm. and then I made the book. I made a book, a photography book which was nowhere to run. And I thought, well, maybe I'll do some songs that, that also fix themselves to this. So I started writing, I think I wrote Come Away, you know, like sitting, you know, by myself in an afternoon at a hotel in Denver or something like that. You know, so they all had this, this thing of America, you know. And so I was really wanting to 
use as much of that as I could and then came back to England and, and, and knew that that's the album I wanted to do. And at that time, I also stopped being in the bad seats again. Okay, okay. For the final time? I think so, yeah, you know. Well, another track I wanted to plug off of uh, Nowhere to Run was Evil Kind. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I like the lyric. I'd had the, the word, the, the, this idea of the two words fitting together for, for quite a while, actually. And they had a different song and a different, but then I thought, you know, uh, motions of the evil kind. But I, I had always liked that line. And then I was playing around with this song, Whispers of Wisdom, da 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 da. da. And, I thought, and then it naturally progressed into the, the evil kind song. And then I saw that I felt this kind of loping sort of drum thing and, uh, and build it in this way to this insane crescendo, you know. And it's too late, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. Well, your uh, your music over the years, especially your uh, solo uh, music, has really shows a lot of versatility. I mm. think probably you're tapping into your your own, you know, favorites. And uh, that, exactly, you know, and, and all yeah. that stuff we spoke about the teenage years, where yeah. every yeah. record was different, and I, right. and I love that, you know. I have the freedom to do that because I'm solo, you know, I don't have a band who plays the same. Right. And so the guitar will do this, then the bass will always do that. It right. can change whenever, you know. I think that's important. I mm -hmm. think that's what people are drawn to as, as well. And you may get comments from your fans about that. But mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about your uh, memoir. Mm -hmm. Up Above the City, Down Beneath the Stars. Uh, from a couple of years ago, yeah. Was that a was that a, a cathartic experience? Uh, strange, uh, in, in some way. Uh, but I, I, I was very in touch with the material. It wasn't like a huge revelation to me. To uh, I'd been in touch with the the material, and and, and so I felt in a way of like. Okay, I'm the character at the center of this story. And so I had this slight sort of separation from myself to write my story. It's like I was connected with a thread. So I would go through all this stuff and I would be writing away behind me, you know, and going, then, you know, this is what happened, but this, and then because of this. So I felt like, but I know, but I knew as well that there was a natural storytelling arc that was going on that, that, that would have an e the kind of end, without giving anything away, the kind of ending that it has over that particular period of 30 years. I knew that. And it had all the elements of, you know, the stories that I've been entranced by or films that I've been entranced by, where it starts off with this strange world of curiosity and then it goes into this other place and it goes dark. And then you go, so Alfred Hitchcock, I think, said, you know, the way to make a film is, you, you know, you, you take a man, you put him up a tree, mm -hmm. and that takes a certain amount of time to do. And then you throw rocks at him, and that takes an enormous amount of time for him to get out of the way. And then you wait to see if he can get down the tree and survive or, or not make it. And I thought, I've got that in my story. Uh -huh. So I can utilize that as a way to present the work so I was like, I couldn't get away from it. Of course, I couldn't get away from myself. And there was times when I was very like, found it excruciating to, to put the truth out. But I thought that's what's going to make the story. You know, people have, people have said to me, you know, I read your book and I just burst into tears. I just like was so moved. I read your book and I was just like, this is incredible insight into the world of a music maker. Well, the, and the pro, various processes they have to go through or choose to go through or not choose to go through however it, you know that work plays out so I, I feel like I did a pretty good job yeah. I feel pleased with it I feel very proud of that book did you find out in doing that uh, some things about yourself that you maybe weren't aware of no no I didn't because I knew yeah you knew. that's where I felt I could have the command to write about them uh, it wasn't suddenly like, oh my God, 
that's a repressed memory from there you know I, I, I knew I knew all of the all of the stuff you know <laughs> okay all right all right um moving on to your uh, your new EP or your latest EP mm -hmm. uh, Steal Away um uh, this has a whole uh, country and western feel. Was that intentional? Yes. Yeah, it was. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's very odd. I, I felt myself in this situation where I wanted to, again, I, I, I talk a lot, I guess, through the lyrics about getting away from something, you know. And I thought steal away was a great sort of, and, and, and just the word steal away kind of remind me of, of some of the great things that have been written in, in American country, you know, and uh, Western music. So I take the journey from like the point of view of like the old days, if you like, of like a runaway slave. That was my, that was my image for the record. Okay, so, so what's, what does this, you know, happen? Let's steal away, and he runs away like with, and then so, but by the end, I, I get into a kind of darker version of that, you know, with the Sundown County song. So I, I'm, I'm examining these aspects and sort of seeing how they work together and moving on from there as well. Yeah. Well, the, the track, the track Steal Away, um, yeah. has, has a nice uh, Western shuffle to it. That's right. Yeah. And the guitar is fun to do. Yeah. And I think in more ways than one, uh, with the lyrics as well, uh, maybe a nod to Johnny Cash. Yeah. Uh, well, <sighs> the fire and yeah because that's yeah and in the book i talk about that song yeah so you know and i say and i fell into hell and the fire you know fell in and the fires of hell and that sort of stuff yeah there is yeah yeah johnny cashback um, <laughs> <laughs> cashback <laughs> <Right. laughs> that's good well um we're uh we're winding down uh barry cool. uh, yeah yeah and I know you need you need a break, and uh, I need, need to give me a break, Greg. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna give you a break. Okay. Yeah. What what part do you want broken? You know. What's, <laughs> <laughs> right. What's, <laughs> what's on the uh, what's on the immediate horizon? Well, uh, I've just finished a beautiful uh, documentary score to a, uh, a song uh, a song to. Uh, a movie, uh, a documentary movie about a film, about a cinema that existed in London in the 80s, uh, late 70s, early 80s, called the Scala Cinema, which was this incredible venue where films would be shown that you would never see anywhere. They were shown there. So it had this culture, you know, it had this, it would draw in these people. So it was almost like the whole movement within itself. That's been really fun to do. Uh, what else have I been doing? A lot of it is I'm writing a new album and I'm writing songs with a, a major artist that I can't really talk about right now. And I'm also writing uh, themes for a burlesque dancer in Los Angeles. And that's been fun. Oh. <laughs> that's, been, that's been like a, a revisitation to the, the man with the golden arm, the big bamboozle, that kind of style. So that's been going on. I'm trying to write uh, a, a book to, to, to follow up um uh, a book of fiction but put put more kind of memoiry things in there but in other characters if you like and i'm sketching out a screenplay i'm always sketching out a screenplay for an idea for something so there's never a dull day in, in adamsonville <laughs> well you it sounds like you enjoy this period in your in your creative life i love it yeah it keeps me going it gets it you know it, it wow it kind of uh, it gets yeah, it's the thing that gets you up and running every day for sure. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna read it up. Yep, there you go. Beautiful. Yeah, love it. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate it, Barry. Thank thank you for your time and and for uh, trekking back down uh, the memories. <laughs> yeah. Dusting off some of those cob cobwebs. Yeah. Exactly. Up yeah. Up there yeah. in the end. But uh -huh. uh, I appreciate uh, you sharing so much okay and uh and doing this nice one well nice to meet you and thanks for having me on that's cool you're very welcome all right greg and uh we will be in touch and we will uh i'll let sean know yeah once it's edited and once i've posted it and 
everything and he can link. I guess he'll be the one linking up to the social media and all that kind of stuff. Well, he'll tell me to link up to social media. And all that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so you can't just sit idly by. Okay. No, no. <laughs> all right. never. Not, not, that's a luxury I can't afford, I tell you. I hear you. I hear you. Well, mm -hmm. best of luck to you, Barry. And, and thank you. And everything that comes your way. And and again, thanks so much. All right. Okay. You're welcome, Greg. Thank you. We'll, we'll be in touch. Uh, Appreciate all right. it. See you later. Bye bye.